is Sky News Business, Australia's business channel. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Welcome to Your Money, Your Call. I'm joined tonight by Jonathan Barrett from Barrett's Bulletin and Matt Sherwood from who is Head of Investment Strategy at Perpetual. Uh, my name's Mark Todd, I'm from Fixed Securities. We're here to have a great Friday night show. We're going to talk about equities, we're going to talk about the fixed income market and probably a lot of commodities and we're going to talk about just broad strategies in general. Um, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks Can so. I start with you, Matt, about... Um, Let's talk about Perpetual, yep. about the size of Perpetual. For some of the viewers at home, they'll have heard of it. It'll, it it's a very old organisation, isn't it? It's been around for a long time. Yep. So they'll be conscious of it, but can you give us a sense of the size of that, that behemoth that it is? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, and your role in it. We've been around for about 128 years. Yep. Um, at the moment, uh, we, we cover all the broad asset classes, so we manage just under $20 billion, uh, in Aussie equities. We've also got a very large and growing fixed income capability, which manages between three Three to four billion. Yep. We've got large balance funds as well, um, and my role in Perpetual is the head of investment market research. So I look at the markets completely at a macro level, yep. um, you know, and provide information to the fund managers who manage from the bottom up. So Finance manager, will, will, will they come to you and be more? Uh, uh, granular and so look, what's your thoughts on say the currency or what's your mm. thoughts on different asset classes like the US market? Is that how they'll have that Yeah, that, that's right and that's, you know, <coughs> when they want that information they'll come and ask me for it and so we're a bottom-up stock picking house yeah. uh, but, you know, obviously uh, firms don't operate in a, uh, you know, in, in a close sphere yeah. so they're all part of the macro environment so, you know, I'll pro provide that information. Yeah, well, you can go to Jonathan. Uh, you know, how, how's business with you, mate? How are things going with you? Oh, Mark, pretty busy. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people are trying to make a lot of decisions, so we're getting a lot of calls at the moment about people wanting to find out actually what's happening out there. Uh, just come back from Hong Kong, and yep. uh, it's getting very expensive up there. So whether that's a sign of things to come down here, I don't know. That is the concern, isn't it? It's, it's around that, that China especially. So is that the themes that you're seeing in terms of your macro themes, is there yep. three that says, look, or, or is there one that stands out and says, look, that's the one that I'm worried about? Yeah, I think there are some definitely yeah. some concerns about Asia. Uh, the other thing people are asking me about the domestic share market is, kind of, ha have I missed the rally? Because um, we were at a road show uh, in May, not this year, but last year, yeah. and the last time the, uh, and our head of equities was there and said, uh, and Matt Williams said, if you're waiting to see the recovery, you're going to miss it. And, you know, that probably has been the case. The market's rallied about a th over a thousand points since then. And, and what, what does that mean for the, the investor, for the people who are looking mm. at home? Is, is mm. that a sense of panic? Because, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, um, I can't quote who this is, but I was looking at a, a, an equity report. The US market has the second largest inflow in over a decade. Equities report an inflow of $6 billion. Yep. Um, what do you do? Do you panic? I've got to get in. Well, the, la the last yeah. thing you ever do is panic um, in, in investments. The first thing, I do. The first thing I do is I panic, and yeah. then I step out of the room and say, no, calm down. No, um, I, I think what it means is the easy gains have been missed, and probably if you want to get into the market now, you're going to have to be price growth. You can still get good income growth in, in the stocks, but the price growth has probably been seen. Yeah, yeah Mark, we, we just see a lot of people worried that, mm. that they have missed the boat, mm. and they're thinking, well, is it going to continue, and should they actually come back to the market and come into the market? And that means the big question, the thing, is there a bubble out there, or is there not? What strategies do you need to, yep. to do in order to get on or, or really to be part of it? But, it? but is that the Australian market? Is that the global market? I remember um, June of this year, mm. I, uh, I w was at a presentation, and it was uh, I was presenting for the idea about... My, my theme was rise above the noise, the noise being mm. so many people coming with all these ideas, and you need to try and work out what you need, yep. and then invest mm. in that event. And so I was saying, look, don't listen to all this. And the other person was saying, I've got a lot of noise and you need to hear all of it. Yep. And his theme was, you've got to buy into the US market, you've got to get in and mm. take the currency and do all that. And, and uh, everyone went with him, you know, and that was fine. Yep. Um, those clients are now dealing with us, you know, six months later. Mm. But, but what are you saying? Are you saying that, that they've missed the rally in US, be calm, or is it all markets have moved 
too aggressively or how do you read yep. that? But I think a lot of people have been too cautious and haven't actually mm. pushed themselves into the market. Yep. And, and when the market moves up, they then start to say, oh, I've got to buy some, I've got to yep. buy, I've got to search for value. And I think that's one of the things, trying to find that value. Yep. And when you do finally get into the market, your ability then to hold onto it. Yep. if in fact the market corrects. Because you've got economics in the US which is not performing the way it should be. You've got uh, just recently um, figures out of China indicating perhaps we're going to a bit of a slowdown there. So, so there's a lot of conjecture at the moment as to what is good value. Yep. Do you, what is really good value out there? It's very hard to, hard to find compelling value in the, in the stock market and I think Jonathan was right. I mean people were too cautious when they should have been more tolerant of risk and now they're probably more tolerant of risk when they should be more cautious. Unfortunately a lot of the markets got it the wrong way round but when, we, we, you know, when I look at the market it's very hard to find compelling value really anywhere. Yeah. The market run very strongly, it's run even more aggressively overseas so I think what we're seeing in Australia where there's not a lot of cheap quality companies out there is something Thing we're seeing globally. I mean, I must admit, when I look at that data point, um, about six billion, mm. more than a decade, and then it just says at the bottom, it's retail investors get into the market. That's yeah. always the first time you say, "Oh, hang on, I don't like this. <laughs> I, I feel so uncomfortable about this." Mm. But when there's blood uh, on the streets, that's when you get in. But yeah, and, I guess people are looking for that. And that's yeah. the concern, of course, is because people hear rising share prices and start getting in rather than rising company earnings and yeah. getting in, we, and mm. they're looking at the wrong metric. And of course, that's always these are the times in the markets when valuations are expensive that you've got to be cautious. Mm. And is that your interpretation as well? It's a, it's a time to be cautious. It, it, it is a time because we the the equity market to push so much but when you reflect back on commodities yep. they haven't moved or they've gone south yep. so when you don't have that inherent demand in the economy you'd expect commodity prices to yep. start to move higher with that growth but they're not yep. so people are getting to a profit by cutting uh, expenses rather than getting to a profit by going out and creating business and that's what productivity productivity we'll talk about that later <laughs> on the show yeah. um, we have our first email for the night the email is from Abby from Curl Curl <coughs> excuse me uh, there was a spike in the recent CPI. Is this a seasonal or structural? Or is this seasonal or structural, Abby? Um, what was your interpretation of the CPI that came out this week? When yep. oh, look, oh, it came out obviously above expectation. The market was looking for 0.8 and got 1.2. That's uh, a big jump. And, and it was a bad miss. Uh, but when we looked at the surprises... But they're they always miss. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's a regular miss. Come on, stop it. But a lot, the, the majority of the misses were really in the, in the, uh, the usual suspects that you would expect when the currencies come off. So big you know, misses in cost of holidays, Travel. cost of fuel. And really when you strip out those more volatile items, uh, I think that inflation was pretty much as the RBA had expected. So I don't think it's a rate cut killer. Uh, but uh, I think there is that cyclical component to it which the RBA will look through but I also think there's a structural story now starting to emerge and that is... Is that what you think? Mm. I think so too, I'll just bring it at home, um, you know, the cost of dinners mm. you know, for a family of five is getting more and more expensive. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had steak for, for five of us and it cost us 60 bucks. Yeah, right. So, so there is this starting to creep in mm. um, which is something that we have to be fully aware of I think. Yep. I mean I think that we need to be conscious of the fact that we have high CPI regardless. We have, we have a high inflation rate compared to the rest of the world. Yep. We're in that two to three range. We're probably in that, now that two to two and a half. We might have been two and a half to three. Yeah. And everyone says inflation's benign. It's not a benign at all. It's, 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 you know, it's a meaningful yeah. number. But, but the other thing which is, which is one of the big issues that I find is we had a lot of investment coming in offshore. Yeah. Uh, a lot of Asian buyers looking in, look putting the property cash in, look at the property market. So if, if you've seen the, and witnessed the property market in Hong Kong, yeah, you can see this market's got a, a long way to go. Hmm. The property market's got a long way to go further, yeah. unless they change their mind and they want to buy it, which yeah. I, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that's going to happen on Monday. Um, <laughs> look, we'll be, I think we're going to a very quick break. We'll be leaving it right there. We'll be straight back after the break. We can get more questions or emails. If you feel like emailing, uh, email your money at skynews.com.au. Talk to you soon. The 
great thing about dogs is watching them grow by your side. As they grow, their dietary needs change, which is why Optimum offers tailored formulas for dogs of all ages, giving them the nutrition they need for life. Dude. Don't dude me, you long-haired yahoo! Need a Snickers. Better? Better. You're not you when you're hungry. Snickers really satisfies. Count the number of batteries you rely on every day. Now multiply it by 7.6 million households. As the demand for battery power increases, plan for a positive future today with your own Battery World franchise. We're getting ready for the $99 weekend. Thousands of big brand vacuums, $99. $300 vacuums, $99. $200 steam ups, $99. Shampoo is $99. Robots, $99. And with every $99 cleaner, get this $99 window cleaner free. Got freeze. This isn't just a hospital, because it's much more than just wards, halls, smocks, scrubs, and busy people. It's brilliant machines reaching beyond these walls. Connecting doctors to hardware, to software, anywhere. Delivering better patient care wherever those patients are. Because a hospital isn't just in a hospital, it's everywhere. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from Peak Securities, and tonight I'm joined by Jonathan Barrett from Barrett's Bulletin. I love that alliteration. <laughs> and Matt Sherwood, who is Head of Investment Strategy at Perpetual, which we've just discussed, is a massive organisation. And um, you've got the macro view. Um, let's talk about uh, specific asset classes. I mean, I, I, I know that you've got some thoughts on gold. Yeah. Are we at any tipping point in any specific asset class where you say, hang on, you should be looking at that one, either from the perspective of it's a sell, you know, be careful, or it's a buy? I yeah. mean, I know we're at... We've, we've spoken about the equities being at mm. sort of fair value and I mm. can't see anything, but you're not saying, you know, get out of them. Well, I think with equities, we're taking that cautious approach. Yep. Yeah, but you're uh, not saying sell, you're not saying... I think I'd, be, I'd, I'd, I'd say I'd be getting out of some, yeah. Oh. I, I think I would be because it's, it's sort of, you've got a good run, take a bit of profit. Um, you know, we're sort of saying, well, look, now it's time to get back into some of the commodity sector. Uh, if we do see some growth happening, that's got to come from that sector. And there are specific commodities which I think still represent very good value. So what do you like in commodities? And, and, and to some extent, for the viewers at home, mm. they, they can probably go out and buy gold. I mean, they yeah. can go and buy you know, ETFs and all that sort of stuff. So if you, can, if you can, whatever commodities you like, can you also think about the way mm -hmm. that, that we're not advocating any one asset class, yeah. so don't get me wrong, we're not saying go and buy those things, but how would people access that? I, I don't yeah. necessarily know myself. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess when you look at it, yeah, like for gold, for instance, you're right, um, people can and, still buy and that. And is gold something you like? Yeah, I still like gold. Gold mm -hmm. hit thirteen fifty today. Mr so. Buffett doesn't, so you're, you're up against Well, not, a only, not only uh, Mr Buffett, but also Bernanke has problems with where gold goes. And, I, and it's a fair value because academically the uh, inflation and gold, people perceive gold going to gold when inflation starts, but it really doesn't work. Uh, gold has a perceived value that people like. And if you think that if the economies are picking up, there's a natural demand for it, for jewellery and, and a lot of other things. So naturally, it, it, it will gravitate higher over time. But, but I guess when you look at some of the other commodities, how do people get involved? Uh, the invent, uh, I guess the invention of the ETF has allowed people to get involved in some of these classes. Mm. Like we look at, um, I guess, uh, uh, commodities such as copper sugar at the moment we think is very low, corn we think is very cheap. Yeah. All these markets have had mm. terrific falls to the downside and the, the mum and dads at home can get access to these, uh, these ETFs that, 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 that allow them. And, and in the event you do, don't put all your money on it because yeah. that would not be balanced. <laughs> um, this is the cautious bond guy. Uh, what's your thoughts on the commodity space? Yep. Oh, I think Jonathan, um, you know, hit some certain good marks um, in his comments, and one tends to think with the U.S. Fed uh, delaying its tapering, that it probably is a bit more upside to the gold price. You know, it's obviously recovered some of the big losses that it uh, it saw earlier this year, yeah. uh, and so there probably is on a tactical space a little bit of upside to the price. But gold's always an investment I'm very wary of. It, it earns you no income. It costs you to store it and insure. It, it normally looks good. so. It looks good. Mm. It, looks good. It's, uh, it does look good, but uh, I, good I'd be wife. very wary of it. 
on a thing, that's for sure. <laughs> that's but right. uh, I, um, you know, I'm always very wary of, uh, about the gold price. Is there any commodities that you do like? Like Jonathan saying, sugar is good and, and mm. corn is good. Is there any commodities that you do like? Yeah, I, I think the soft commodities are, are looking, you know, more attractive than uh, than the others. But I tend to think that probably the improvement we're seeing in China, just you know, slightly better growth, and also the uh, big mining companies cutting their capex, so it's going to limit the supply response. It probably does mean there is some um, upside potentially uh, in the copper market. If the global economy uh, improves, uh, you know, you would expect copper to uh, to rally a bit more. Copper so, doesn't move throughout this whole yeah. this whole move. It's just stayed in a very very narrow range. Yeah, it's sitting at three thirty. Yeah, um, you know, and, and if, if copper doesn't move and, and these these commodities look cheap. Let's say we don't ask the, the, the viewers to go and buy, you know, or an ETF and all that sort of stuff. How do they get the advice around the equity they should buy? So if copper was to move, mm. who's the beneficiary? Is it, you know, is it, is it an easy thing to do? They just go to the stockbroker and say, look, I think corn is cheap. Who, who's the beneficiary? Is yeah. that something you'd look Absolutely. at? Absolutely. A stock that, that, that obviously has investments in that sector yep. um, is the one to go for. You know, like if you look at... Well, yeah. who's corn? Uh, corn, you look at sort of the grain corp, some of the big guys there. Yeah, um, yeah they're the ones that you, you look at for some form of investment. And what's your thoughts on oil? I mean, that's that's the big. <laughs> the world is awash with oil. Mm. <laughs> it's, just, it's amazing how in the United States w there was that period where they're running out, it's a disaster, and you know Obama had that great theme about we need to cut off, uh, you know, the Middle East. Yeah. We need to not be dependent on those. We're going to be all dependent, so we're going to have wind farms and the like. Uh, he neglected to make we're going to frack the life out of the place. <laughs> yep. uh, you know, I suppose the jury's still out on that, isn't it? Or is, as far as no, farms not concerned. at all. I mean, I think when you look at the US, it's going to be self-sufficient in oil. You know, in the next what, 15, 20 years, hmm. it's a scary thought. It's that, an incredible thought that you've got a lot of energy out there, and and the recent move we're seeing lower for oil. You know, indicates that perhaps some of those transport stocks, um, but things are the ones which might start to look represent good value. Yeah. You've seen a ten percent fall in the price of the commodity. So if you filter that through to to other stocks that, that require a lot of energy, then it does start to represent a, a store of value for them. It is an amazing concept that you think that we're going to be all independent in the United States when they were. You know, if you if you ever go there, you know, it's hard to imagine because it's. It's, it's World War cars. Yeah. Yes. They've really got to run out of this stuff soon because of the way they drive. Yeah, I mean, in four years they become the world's biggest oil producer yeah. as well as four the biggest years. oil it's, it's uh, consumer. Yeah. And of course that has, that's having massive uh, impacts on the US economy because firms are now starting to re-industrialise and you know, bring their operations back home. Uh, yeah. Cheap energy is a massive uh, advantage that any country can have. Australia's had it for you know, a century uh, and America's getting it back so obviously this is going to uh, marginalise the Middle East a lot, yeah, yeah. reduce the defence costs of you know, escorting the oil supply ships and uh, you know, it's, it's just a win-win for the US uh, economy. It'll probably reduce the volatility in the oil price as well yeah. and I think that's one of the, the keys that a lot of people like. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting how that there's been a you know sort of environmental discussions about it, and they've said right this is this is the major uh, push for the economy. But one of the things that was a big push was you need to bring the money back, and that was where Apple came into the, the conversation. Yeah. You need to bring that money back, and we need to have that back on side. So the the patriotism came in later on. Didn't it? Well, you know, coerced patriotism. Hmm. Um, how's the coerced patriotism around the taper? When does taper happen? When does taper happen? <laughs> I don't know, yeah. for a while now. Yeah, taper, <laughs> we were always at the view, you know, we're out publicly, uh, the, the tapering was a 2014 story and so I'd Could be been a lone wolf on that I was and I was very nervous on September 14 before yeah. the meeting because um, I, I you know, we just didn't show up to wait <laughs> no I just looked at the, I looked at the markets yeah. on my yeah. phone yeah. and I saw a rally so I'd know what yeah. I knew what I mean, had happened I'm going in early <laughs> that's right um, <laughs> our, and I'd ex expect that the Fed will taper around the June quarter next year yeah. so the markets yeah. are you know looking at early next year but I think it's going to be a bit later they, they want to tick all the boxes and really you're not going to get any kind of sustainable US recovery unless the housing market is growing uh, and I think that's still going to take time to engineer. We've seen the result of mortgage applications just from a very you know, marginal pickup in, in the US uh, fixed housing rate. I mean, yeah. mortgage applications have declined rapidly. You saw so, the Citibank numbers. I mean, what's your thoughts on, on all that? I mean, the, the well, I guess I'm a little bit outside of conventional thinking here mm -hmm. because I think that the tapering is going to take some time. But it, they're going to get themselves into an issue when they, they come to the next debt ceiling debate if the economy hasn't seen some form of growth. Yep. So, so I'm actually looking for 
some form of stimulus and probably from a fiscal aspect yep. uh, try and enter into the, uh, into the debate because they need to see growth to occur. If they see growth occurring, then that debt ceiling debate just becomes non-existent. So you've got to have growth, and I think they're going to be focused on trying to get growth. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's right. They've just got to get growth, and because of the productivity issue around... Yeah, but it's very hard to get growth in an economy which still has these balance sheet issues. I mean, yeah. the household sector's looking better. Yeah. The government sector's clearly got to tighten its belt, but at the same time, it's almost got to loosen it to yeah. get the private sector moving. And it's, it's a much more difficult task than it has been um, in previous cycles just because of that balance sheet issue in the household sector. And, and also the... the, the the yeah. politics of it all. Yeah, but you also got to look at the amount of corporate cash yep. on corporate on balance sheets in America. That has to be teased out into the market. So uh, that's true, but when you think about it, um, corporate uh, business spending is only eight yeah. percent of U.S. spending. It's much smaller than what it is in Australia. Yeah, so really, you've got to. Second, uh, but the first thing we're going to talk about <laughs> after the break. Uh, Matt's written a book. It's called Intelligent Investing. We'll talk about that after the break. We'll go to a very short break. But if you feel like calling us, one three hundred thirty thirty four thirty five. For any questions or investing questions, your money at skynews.com.au is the email. We'll be right back. Mazda has put a lot of energy into the all new Mazda 6. In a world first, every time you brake, a capacitor stores the energy generated, then uses it to save you fuel. And when you accelerate, Skyactiv technology gives sporty performance, saving even more fuel. It's the safest, most advanced Mazda ever. All new Mazda 6. It's driving re-energised. With CFDs, I can trade on the rise and fall of indices, shares, forex and commodities. It's important I can pursue 24-hour trading opportunities and still control my risk. I use CFDs when I want to trade the markets without putting up the full value of my position. That's why I trade CFDs with IG, the global CFD specialist, creating opportunity since 1974. Come on my house, my house. My passion. I'm gonna give you everything. My cat. I mean everything. My choice. Die. Follow your passion. People have been asking where Cadbury Dairy Milk Bubbly comes from. This is where the magic happens. Introducing Cadbury Dairy Milk Bubbly. Now even bubblier. Inside and out. This isn't just a classroom, because it's much more than papers, pens, desks and diagrams. This classroom is really in a classroom. This is science shared. The best teaching the brightest, using brilliant machines to empower local industry to compete on a global scale. Because our most valued resource isn't our technology or even the resource itself, it's our people. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from Fixed Securities and joining me tonight on the show is Jonathan Barrett from Barrett's Bulletin and Matt Sherwood, who is Head of Investment Strategy at Perpetual and Matt has actually written a book. He's an author and we're going to talk about that book right now. And I'm told to hold the book up so you can all see it. Um, it's called The Intelligent Investing. It retails for $35. But for those of you who would care to have a copy of this book, the first 10 people that email through to your money at skynews.com.au will get a copy of this book. We'll send it out next week. So for the first 10 people, if you care to have the book, you could listen to what Matt has to say and then not want the book. You can send it back, of course. <laughs> but let's talk about the book. Um, now, you came, you, you came to a conclusion that, that you needed to create a book that could be read by anyone and everyone yep. and talk about... Um, Investing in a in a, a fundamental form, yep. is that, and I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want to describe as simple. That's not right because because Buffett explains things in a fundamental form that makes a lot of sense, and yep. it's, it, he takes complex circumstances and, and explains it well. So, and I'm not saying you're Buffett, but but how did that go? What's the reaction to it, and and how did you come about doing that? Um, well, I actually wrote it for my father-in-law, who was a cash investor and had been for, for many, many decades. So I really just went about the way of, uh, of explaining to him how you pick good quality companies and to show him really the power of the corporation. Is he still with us? Uh, he is. 
Is he still talking to you? He is. He's <laughs> and I'm still married to his daughter. <laughs> even better. So even better. And I'm actually in his good books. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that investing is most powerful when it is simple. It's based yeah. on quality companies, you know, successful businesses, um, and it is uh, done over a long period of time. I mean, that really what is what investing is. And yeah. so within the books, I, uh, I talk about how you pick good companies, what you look for, balance sheets, operating models, management. Uh, and then I talk about some of the things that people wouldn't be aware of about in, in investing. So most, yeah, most people think that the basis of wealth creation is capital growth, but actually I show in the book that actually it's the power of income, uh, which creates uh, uh, wealth through time. But, but for, the, for the folks at home, when you talk about income, you don't mean income I get and I spend. You mean income I get and I, I reinvest. And I reinvest. <laughs> That's correct. It, it's like the bonds. Yeah, it? so if you put a thousand dollars away, and this is how I illustrate in the book, you put a thousand dollars away in the market at the end of 1974, you yep. would have made 179,000. Now, 23,000 of that came from dividends, 24,000 came from price growth, and 133,000 came from reinvesting that dividend back that's into the asset. Yield and that's not right. Not yeah, not that, that's exactly right. It's the power of compounding. And of course, what I go in the book then to show is that most people associate uh, and think that yield and income is the same thing, yep. but they're completely different concepts. Yields uh, is a ratio, whereas income is a cash flow. Yep. They don't, you know, one does not represent the other. And then I talk about some of the other traps people fall into in investing. When did you yeah. write the book? I first wrote it in 2011, and I've just done a second edition. Yep. The first edition sold out. Oh, that's good. Yep. I mean, is it because everyone, you know, the big theme that we have here in the show is it's all about education. Yep. The, 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 the number of self-managed super fund growth is just phenomenal. It's it is. the biggest sector in the market. Yep. And, and to some extent, it's not really catered for. And, I, I, and, I, and I, it's, not a, it's not meant to be a criticism. It's meant to reflect it's, no one really knows how yet because it's so big. It, it, everyone has got their goals where they're saying, and this is, you know, everyone's got a, a job, you know, I can share the photos of my kids, I need to get paid. You know, yep. Everyone's on yep. the same boat. Yep. But at the same time, it's very hard to work out. It's such a big piece. And, and we had a, a viewer call through last week lovely chap, he's in his 60s and he's taken it, he's retired and now he's going to invest. Mm. There's a challenge in getting up the speed quick enough that you haven't lost your money. You know, yeah. it, it, you know we're saying buy bonds because they're, they're, they're a cautious step in so. But how did you come to the conclusion with that? So, so many people are competing for that space, how do they find it? Just oh, in bookstores? No, you actually just find tent. it on my website and so... Um, so can we talk about that? Can, yep, it's, we're just it's, gonna, oh, This is great. The, the, uh, Matt Sherwood Show, we're going to go with the website now. Um, what's, your, what's your website? Yeah, it's www.intelligentinvestingcorp, so C-O-R-P, dot yep. com dot au. Okay. So well, feel free to get onto that, and can we email you on that? Is that something that's got that Yeah, capacity? absolutely. It's Matt S at intelligentinvestingcorp.com.au, yeah. and you know, I'm happy to take questions from, uh, from investors. Yeah, so. and please don't send any questions on specific shares, because he just won't answer that. Mm -hmm. Just pretend it's, it's service down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can we talk about, uh, and that, I honestly think that looks really good because it's not, I, you know, I, I bought a mass of these yep. and, and they keep the doors open on hot days and they you know, help me with my insomnia, yep. but there's not many that, you know, there's a couple of good Buffett books, but that's, there's not many yep, that, that are That's good. one of the big problems because everyone's now looking at not the self-managed super funds as, as a form of, um, you know, trying to get their wealth and spread their wealth yep. and grow their wealth. but. Not a lot of people understand how to do it, yeah. unless you've been in the markets for a long time. Yep. And as you correctly pointed, it's trying to get up that curve quick enough. And the last sort of like six years have caught a lot of people unawares. And now a lot of people are scared, but they know they've got to get back in. And yep. not just that, but the, historically people have just bought equities. And that's been what they've done. And when the, and the market rallied through the 2006 7 it was all great. You're retiring, yep. and yep. it worked really well. And then when it didn't work, and, you, and uh, the fund managers didn't have the skill set, no one saw what this was going to happen. No one predicted it's not really. Um, the people that you love and care for, who you were investing on behalf mm. of, yep. so my super fund for my family, yep. turned and said, I thought this was easy. I think, mm. you know, you were, and, and it turned out to be not that easy and it became very stressful within the entire environment. But, but regardless, it's, it's a massive growth because people want control. There's yep. that diversification too and having that product for mm. people to diversify. Yep. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, no. you just want to weight it accordingly. Uh, but if you do it yourself, you've got to understand, it's just like a farmer. Yeah. You know, a farmer on a property needs to know everything. Yep. He's in control of it. Same with a self-managed super farmer. Uh, we have our first caller for the night. It's Luke would like to talk to us about bonds in our portfolio. So Luke, how can we help you? 
Yes, uh, gentlemen, uh, just uh, the liaison between bonds and equities or shares, uh, when should you use bonds? I'm quite aware of the equities. Yep. So could you let us know what, how to use bonds? And I believe there's corporate bonds and government bonds, is that correct? Correct. Um, my first thoughts are that the, the timing of that is around the timing of you. So as you need more regular income and have less capacity for volatility in, in price, and so as you get older, you're looking for more consistency in earnings, uh, that's when you start to transition into bonds. And Luke, what we've often said at FIG is that the bond componentry to your portfolio should probably be reflected in your age. At 50, half your portfolio can be in fixed income. Within that fixed income, that half, of, that 50%, uh, you can have more volatile bonds, clearly. But as you approach, uh, you know, my father-in-law's age in, in his late 80s, it's it's all about fixed income. It's all about consistency of earnings, and it's all about where he can get his better coffee. So, um, uh, you know, that that's how you'd shift it around. It's more your demand for consistency of earnings, and then then you make it make your uh, investments around that basis. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, Luke, I, I tend to agree. Uh, I think diversification is quite important. Um, you know, when you, when you need that uh, cash flow, and I think uh, a bond is one way to do it. Um, and if I look at my portfolios, I do have some bonds, I've got some equities, and I've got some properties. Yep. Uh, I, I think uh, one thing that, uh, that was hit on in the question, which was important, of course, is the distinction between government and corporate bonds. Now, uh, you want to buy bonds when the yields are the highest, and you yes. want to sell them when they're the lowest. And so, at the moment, we think there's a really good opportunity uh, in the corporate bond space. Uh, it's got more price protection, we think, than government bonds, and it's giving a higher yield. Yeah, um, so, I, I, I tend to think that that's terrific. a very attractive the option. For the pros. Yeah. Uh, we have to go to another short break, but feel free to give us a call on 1300. 30, 34, 35 for any questions you have on investing and the email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au and we'll be right back. Maltesers, the lighter way to enjoy chocolate. An Omega 3! Just waiting for the time. A lot more than just nature goes into nature's own. Hey kids, look at this. It's called forward collision mitigation. It's like the car has its own eyes. And then there's adaptive cruise control. Do you hear that, Jane? Adaptive. And don't get me started on MMCS. It's amazing! Mission Control Orbital 1, do you copy? Mission Control Orbital 1, Tom. The new 2014 Outlander. With so much technology, it's out of this world. Every day, hundreds of thousands of us head off to jobs that help build this country. And all of us want something to show for it. Over the last 29 years, Seabus Super has achieved an average return of over 9% per annum. With investments in projects, that help create jobs. For all of us. CBUS. Thank you. That'll be $10, please. OK. Here's all of my card details. $250, please. OK. Here's all of my card details. That'll be $150, please. OK. Here's all of my card details. <laughs> Stop giving out your card numbers all over the net. <laughs> no one sees your financial details when you check out with PayPal. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call, the Friday edition. I'm Mark Todd from Fig Securities, and joining me tonight again is Jonathan Barrett from Barrett's Bulletin and Matt Sherwood, who is Head of Investment Strategy at Perpetual. And we're now going to talk about the exchange rates. Um, Let's talk about that because the, the RBA doesn't want it here. So, yep. so what does the RBA do? 
Well, unfortunately, the RBA in many ways has shot themselves in the foot because after every rate cut they do to try to get the currency down, they almost come out and say, that's it, that's it, there's no more, you know, we, we're not going to do any more. And obviously people go, oh, no more rate cuts. Yeah. And the currency, instead of going south, actually starts heading north. Um, so I think they probably are worried at the moment, the fact that they're trying to engineer this growth handover, the currency's working against them, it was down at 89, now it's up at 95. Yeah. So it has rallied, you know, the QE tapering delays obviously yeah. is, is, is impacting that, uh, but I think they want it in the low 80s, so if they're a long way from, from where they want it. Did, did either of you watch the Philip Lowe, the Deputy Governor Philip mm. Lowe, uh, his speech today? Yep. Uh, you know, what was your interpretation of that when, he, when they asked about the, the currency? What, what did you think? Well, I generally think that the, the RBA wants the currency lower. How they get it lower, I'm not mm. quite sure. Because if you look at what happened with the CPI data, the Aussie should have gone up. It actually went down. Yeah. So I think there's perhaps more suspicion, yeah. uh, which, they come, which will come to play. Um, the jawboning. Jawboning, yeah. yeah. And if that's the case, then they might. But mm. the RBA really hasn't got the firepower to influence the currency. Yeah. Um, what did you think sorry. of the Deputy Governor Lowe? Because I, I, I actually thought he, at one stage he was going to put his hands up and say, look, don't blame me. I can't do anything about it. It's not my fault. Yeah, and many it was ways like my ten-year-old. Because um, uh, currency is a relative concept. It's not like all of a sudden Australia is so much better. Mm. You know, it's just at the moment the rest of the world is still you know reasonably Weak. bleak, um, and so therefore it's very hard for an economy which hasn't had a recession in 23 years, which has you know still large growing trade with China, commodity prices are you know mm. are probably bouncing up just a little bit. Yeah. You know, so all of the thing in the in the Fed's delayed tapering, you put all that together it's a hard time to get the currency lower and of course the RBA um, by saying you know no more rate cuts we're on hold you know is making their job even harder. What, what effect does, does China have on our economy then do you think I mean how, how is that playing out because we've got some Chinese numbers that were concerning and then the currency you know got well, hit. I think that was the, that was the, the, the key point this week because yep. when you see the People's Bank of uh, China PBOC not intervening into the interbank market in China. It's a sign so, that. So, for the viewers China. at home, um, bank. What happens is the central bank of China is supposed to give liquidity. They are supposed to lend to the market, and they're concerned about what they call the shadow economy, where the money is actually going, who's on lent it, mm. and so as a consequence, they're trying to control that behaviour of those secondary lenders by not giving them any money. And um, you know, it doesn't work in my family, but it, it effectively is a, it's a tightening. Yeah, it's that's right. It's a monetary uh, policy. It's tightening the, the economy, and so the economy in itself might start to contract a bit. Yeah, that's true. And um, they're trying to contain inflation. They're trying yeah. to contain property prices, which is obviously uh, rising reasonably aggressively at the moment. And so, you know, it does look like they're doing it in a more controlled way than what they did in June. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, the impact of China on Australia is very immense. Yeah, and, it, and it's a significant geopolitical argument they're having within China, aren't they? It, it is... Um, it is trying to modernise the economy mm. and, and get it up to, I don't want to call it Western standards, that's not what I'm saying, it's international standards. It's, mm. It says the data is consistent all the time and mm. they're trying to do that but, and that's a challenge. Yeah, Mark, it's also got to be functional for the economy in itself because it's so large. Yeah. There's the internal economy um, and the external economy, but the economy needs to drive it because it needs to find jobs for the 1.3 billion people. Yeah. Yep. So they, they want to keep China as one nation one trading block yeah. and they, they have to make sure and manufacture growth at around that seven and a half, seven, eight mm. percent, otherwise it could start to fall for us. But, yeah. but purely from a data perspective, and it's so hard, yeah, those billions of people trying to get that data, that is a challenge to say, I got it all the time, you know, it's just crazy. Mm. Um, speaking of data, how's the Japanese data? I liked it. Today's data, I thought it was pretty good. Um, I think the effects of the weakening yen are certainly helping. Yep. CPI was up just a little bit. Yep. Um, I enjoy the economy at the moment. I think we are seeing a, a cyclical improvement. It's all on the back of the currency depreciation yep. we're seeing in the yen. My suspicion is in 12 months' time, Japan will hit roadblocks because Abe's not really dealing with the big structural impediments in the Japanese economy, the lack of efficiency, the uh, ageing population, the, you know, the population demographics are terrible there. They're addressing every issue bar the important ones.
So. Um, have you got any data points you can talk to the viewers about in terms of Japan? I mean, the yep. ageing population. I mean, what, I always use the one about they sell more uh, adult nappies than children. But, yeah, that's right. I mean, that is just the most amazing concept to me. Yeah, and the important thing really in Japan... Wearing adult nappies is an amazing concept. Yeah, to be the thing with Japan, though, of course, in the next 30 years, their population is going to shrink by 25%, which means that unless you get big productivity improvements, their economic output will shrink by about the same amount. 30 years, it'll shrink by how many? 25%. The population. Population of Japan. It's got a very large older population. Now, obviously, every year that uh, that uh, um, you know some we people leave America. the earth, um, and so that's a, a big demographic problem they have, and they've never been able to address that's it. And the easiest way people. to fix that, of course, is a broad immigration program. But the Japanese government is very, very hesitant about introducing that. Yeah. They're, they're very, also, the structural issues in terms of their own financing mm. um, for international investors trying to get into Japan. It, it's also quite hard to even open a bank account. Um, you know, it's just one of those things where you hit roadblock after roadblock when you're actually trying to invest in Japan and trying to run businesses here. Yeah. The, whenever I go to Japan, the major roadblock I see is the people on the street trying to do the roadworks who do absolutely nothing. Yep. I mean, there are people there. If you, if you go out... <laughs> It'll just be standing by the road, waving you through, yep. moving three lanes into one, and there's nothing there. There's a four-inch hole in the ground, and yeah. there's four guys with white gloves saying, don't tread in the they hole. They never I mean, get those gloves dirty. You know. But doesn't that sound like Pitt Street sometimes? <laughs> oh, this, is, this is on a macro scale. This is much bigger. Uh, we'll have to leave it there. We'll, we'll go for a very quick break. We'll be right back in just a moment. For the $99 weekend. Thousands of big brand vacuums, $99. $300 vacuums, $99. $200 steam ups, $99. Shampoo is $99. Robots, $99. And with every $99 cleaner, get this $99 window cleaner free. Got freeze. Hi. I'm after a facelift. Really? Oh, this? No, no, no. Uh, it's the office. It's looking a bit old. Oh. We can help you with that. Smarten up the office with these super strong stackable replica Tolik stools. An incredible $29. And add style and character to your workspace with this Hayes Chrome bookcase, a low $98. Our assembly service will make it easier too. Yeah. If you've got the big ideas, Officeworks has the lowest prices. Copy that. From 24,990 drive away, the new 2014 ASX is the street smart SUV. This isn't just a hospital, because it's much more than just wards, halls, smocks, scrubs and busy people. It's brilliant machines, reaching beyond these walls, connecting doctors to hardware and software anywhere, delivering better patient care wherever those patients are. Because a hospital isn't just in a hospital, it's everywhere. Welcome to Your Money, Your Call. I'm joined tonight by Jonathan Barrett, who is from Barrett's Bulletin, and Matthew Sherwood, who is Head of Investment Strategy at Perpetual. And they're here to answer any of your questions. Feel free to call us at 1300 30 34 35, and the email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au. And hopefully you'll email about Matt's book, which is pretty good. We looked at it in the, uh, in the ad break. Um, we've spoken a bit about the US. Let's talk about the US politics. Have they solved their problems? What, what's your thoughts in terms of do the uh, moderate Republicans now win the argument against the Tea Party people? Do the Democrats say, oh, well, that was a tough fight and we'll have a break? Or does the Democrats just go hard into them and, and carry on? Have we kicked the can down the road for three months and we do debt ceiling? Or, or what do you think, John? Do we... oh, kicking the can down the road hasn't no. solved any issues. Yep. Um, I think it's weakened a few answers out there. But at the end of the day, they've still got some problems which need to be solved. Yep. There's still a bit of fight left in it. Um, I, I sort of feel that the 
the more we have issues there, the, the more it's going to affect confidence mm -hmm. um, because people are losing a lot of faith in the ability of Congress to do its job. Yeah. And I think that to me is I, I think that's problem. gone. They've lost that. That's their but that, that is approval sort of, rate somewhere in the 20%. Yeah, it's yeah. the lowest ever. The lowest um, ever. Since yeah. they, you know, Mr Smith went to Washington, it's a disaster. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing for me when I just look at the politics of the US, I think the Republican Party is completely split. Yep. Um, yeah. And that's their problem because they're coming up for the midterms. You're going to have one half the party running off saying one thing, the other half saying the other. And of course, there's no unified messaging. So, uh, to me, um, if I'm reading the politics right in America, the Democrats are going to go in with some controversial bills on things like immigration reform. This is where the, press, the pressure points are for the Republicans. So, if the Democrats are smart politically, they will start to, you know, squeeze those pressure points. So, the Republicans are like the Labor government. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder whether, you know, uh, I wonder, there are so many jokes that you said, and I'll, I'll ignore all of them. So we're going to go on our prayer for it. Anyway, um, the, the, uh, I wondered whether Obama has a legacy issue, you know, because he needs to get some um, cross the aisle experience. He needs to get them to get some resolution. So t to, while they're down, you know, lay the slipper, I, I, I don't have that smart politics. And I think he's hmm. a smart parliamentarian. I, I remember when he was there going to the Republican Party convention and speaking to all the Republican Party you know, conventions and said, look, I'll answer any of your questions. We need to work together as Americans. Yep. I wonder whether the, the moderates, because the moderates have got some voice now. Um, Buffett's come out in support of the moderate Republicans. Mm -hmm. I just wonder whether they've got some voice to make some changes within their own party. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's very hard because I think the Republicans are dominated by the hard right and so yeah. yes there are some moderate voices and I think they're seen as being more reasonable and dealing with very common uh, you know very important issues in a very common sense sort of way yeah. and we saw that during the the, the recent government shutdown yeah. you know the moderate Republicans got together with the moderate Democrats yeah. and tried to nut solutions out and then they of course were kiboshed in uh, right. in right. the house right. by the Tea Party yeah. so it probably is an opportunity for the Republican Party to reposition itself and really then it's just a question of will. But I think what Jonathan says is, is right and this, this is causing confidence issues that no business will be wanting that, to invest that's, that's right. that, while that's these next, battles yeah. are going on. I mean, that was my next question I want to talk about. I mean, what are you thinking about the, the you know, uh, Q4, yeah. uh, A, the confidence, B, the productivity, you know, the, everything, it's just nuts. It's, so, this is one of the big debates we all have. You know, we, we've said equity markets keep on going up. Mm. Um, but we're still saying we've got chronic issues, which which are still out there. Yeah. Um, and that's the debate that I think a lot of people out there are saying, well, hang on, we're all sitting here as experts saying there are big problems there. Mm. What do we do now? Yeah. Um, and I think in the States, and I keep a, a close eye on the uh, Reuters Michigan confidence numbers. Yep. Yep. Um, I just see because if people are confident, they'll spend. Yep. And if they don't see the confidence and the ability to the government to govern correctly mm. and make decisions, then they're not going to spend. Mm. And, and that's where I see that. Um, growth aspect in the state sort of starting to taper off a little bit, yeah. uh, which means we've got to keep the stimulus up in order to keep asset values. Uh, it makes it very hard to taper when they've, they've set yeah. their benchmark yeah. being employment, mm. and, and we have a jobless recovery and we have a weak employment market. Well, the other thing what too, big, the big one is the housing market's rolling over. Um, the recovery and so uh, these political disagreements are really coming at the worst point of the cycle. We've got the, the best sort of uh, outlook for growth we've had really since the GFC and yet it all seems to be rolling over. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and right now I've been going bad because yeah. you, you can't get refinance. I, I just mentioned briefly about the Citibank numbers. Uh, Citibank posted some poor earnings and, and part of it was driven by the fact that their mortgage business mm. yes. is collapsing. Yes. And, and it makes sense. Yep. You know, mortgage is 30 year mortgage at three or four, now at five, six. So I'm not going to refinance. I'm not going to do any work in the house. I'm just going to mm. stay where I am. I'm staying fixed. Um, if if the US needs better employment and we know there's a jobless recovery, uh, that's going to be a challenge, particularly the fact that yeah. the interest rates have gone higher against what the Fed wants. Yep. But you had some thoughts on the participation numbers because you, you're saying you've got a different view on participation. Do you want to talk me through it? Yeah, uh, I think there's a big uh, demographic trend that people are kind of overlooking and that is of course the retirement uh, progressively of the, of the baby boomers and so what we've seen is that unemployment in Australia and also in, in America um, has really been supported, the unemployment rate has been supported by drops down in the participation rate yeah. and of course that's seen you US unemployment fall from 10% to around 7.3% you know, 7 now, but as you say, there's not a lot of jobs growth to absorb the new entrants, yeah. and so 
the unemployment rate is giving a distortive uh, outlook for the US economy. You'd look at that and think, yeah, things are getting better. But really, it's the uh, lower growth rate in, in the working age population which is distorting this number. And this is important for investments because typically we look at lower unemployment means more wages growth, more people consuming, more people spending, better earnings. Now, of course, that's not necessarily the case now. So, uh, the unless it's in the healthcare sector, mm. unless it's in those. Mm. No, your point, the, the, the demographics in the United States, mm. the aging thing is a massive number of the people. I mean, I know they're going to, to your point, um, immigration reform, bringing people in, making yep. them docu document Americans, so it's not the same as, as Japan. Mm. But it's a real issue that the mm. aging population everywhere uh, will, will suffer from. How do you, as an investor, think invest for the aging population? Mm. You, you start yeah. thinking healthcare. You hear everyone talk about it. Exactly. Yep. It's just massive. Yes. It, they, they reckon at the end of the day, the last five years is your life's the most expensive yeah. from a medical perspective. Yep. So, yeah. it's, it's, so, so that means the the participation rate gets worse. We need some uh, some reforms yeah. around immigration, mm. and, and that's why you're thinking that the Democrats might so drive that through. Yeah, I, I tend to think also it's the time in the cycle to try to get that bill through. They know the Republicans are fractured, and it's a very important reform for the U.S. economy. So I think those two things are meeting together, and they're probably going to push ahead with that in early 2014. It's going to it's going to put. Um, I, and we're going to talk about it because we'll go to a break in a second, but we're going to talk about the fact that the global cash rates and the idea that we've got forward guidance for the first time ever, really. We've got a theme about that forward guidance where interest rates were so low, and they didn't. In June, they just got smashed. They got sold off, and that's why we've got the mortgage markets moving up. So I, I just want you to think in the ad break, how successful will it be? Are we moving back into that trend? Um, we will go to a very short break, and we'll be back for our last segment for the night. So we'll be straight back. Hey kids, look at this. It's called forward collision mitigation. It's like the car has its own eyes. And then there's adaptive cruise control. Do you hear that, Jane? Adaptive. And don't get me started on MMCS. It's amazing! Mission Control to Orbital 1, do you copy? Mission Control to Orbital 1, Tom. Tom, do you copy? The new 2014 Outlander. With so much technology, it's out of this world. This isn't just a classroom, because much more than papers, pens, desks and diagrams. This classroom is really in a classroom. This is science shared. The best teaching the brightest, using brilliant machines to empower local industry to compete on a global scale. Because our most valued resource isn't our technology or even the resource itself. It's our people. An Omega 3! Just waiting for the time. A lot more than just nature goes into nature's own. World Vision works with parents so children can attend school and avoid early marriage. But we need your support. Help protect a childhood. Sponsor a child today. Call 13 32 40 or visit worldvision.com.au. G'day, mate. You just bought me. Great. See you next week. Gracias, Senor Cardi. I am all yours. Hey, see you in Australia. Merci, Monsieur Cardi. I am on my way. Au revoir. Enjoy the flight. Stop putting yourself at risk over and over again. Oh, what? Get up to $20,000 worth of buyer protection when you check out with PayPal. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. We're in the last segment for tonight. I'm joined by Jonathan Barrett from Barrett's Bulletin and Matt Sherwood, who is Head of Investment Strategy at Perpetual. Uh, a lot of you have emailed, which is terrific for, for uh, Matt. He can start work on Monday. be happy about that. Um, the, uh, the fact is that we can't put these emails up, and we will respond to all these emails next week. We've got some file issues that we can't play them. So we will get back to you both with a book and with uh, a response to any of your questions. Um, we're in our last segment. We've got a couple of minutes. Let, let's talk about the idea that the, if the other policy is going to be able to achieve what they said, which is ECB, uh, the Fed, um, Canada, Bank of England, even Australia, interest rates will be low for longer. Is, is 2016 when interest rates start to go up, is, is that what you think, Jonathan, or, or how would you No, I, I tend to think that they'll try and do it as much as possible. Um, at the moment, all the central banks are trying to 
um, get inflation to start to pick up. Yep. It's been unchecked at the moment. You just look at what happened in Bank of England, where we saw rain above the benchmarks. Yep. So I think they'll be dictated by how inflation starts to pan out, and then they'll have to move. Okay, so so what are we talking? What when 2014, 2015? Like? Well, I think I think I think it'll be. Where sooner. does the rubber hit the road? Yeah, I think it'll be sooner. Uh, I think they'll, they'll have no choice really. Um, if you look at where inflation's running, particularly in the UK, uh, above the benchmarks at the moment, um, they they're giving it as much leeway as possible, yep. so they can stimulate the economies. But as we've seen in China. Just this week, they're putting the brakes on their economy as well. Yep. So, you know, they've got inflation, so they're going to act. Hmm. What do you think, Matt? I think in Europe, for example, the ECB is on hold for as far forward as I can possibly see. Yeah. Um, you know, I think same with the Bank of Japan. Uh, I think the Fed will probably be raising rates at the end of 2015. Yeah. Um, I still think there's very little inflationary pressure in that economy. It's still so below the bottom yeah. of, of the Fed's target. Um, and so I think they have time on their side. You know, the UK's obviously got an inflation uh, issue that they're trying to deal with. What is um, the UK inflation? What is the number? 2.4. Yep. But, you know, it's certainly not bad and it's much lower mm. than what it has been, but it's still above that target. Yeah. Um, so, you know, probably uh, they will start to lo at least reduce the QE, you know, and, and the policy support that way first. And I think rate hikes, probably with the UK anyway, is still a 2015 story. Yeah. But I mean, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, you, if you're tapering, you're reducing monetary, you're tightening monetary yeah. policy anyway. I mean, I, I think when Matt was talking about buying corporates versus governments, I, I completely agree with that because, you know, you, you can get good quality names mm. you would know, investment grade payback in the 6% returns, yep. whomever they may be, you know, you can get between 5.5 and, and 6 mm. for, for longer dated duration, whether it be, a, a, I don't know, Stockland, um, um, Qantas, mm. Lendlease, these sorts of organisations. And I just feel that the trade is just, if I believe that the policy makers have got it right, that they're keeping rates low, you just run down that yield curve because I don't think they will, I think they'll be very reluctant to lift rates only because of one thing, and that's the consumer. Yeah. It's taken them so hard to mm. move the consumer that it's hard to see that they won't be very reluctant to move the consumer back into that mm. negative feeling. Yeah, I completely agree with that, and I think there, there's two issues. Uh, one is the sensitivity of the consumer to any uh, rise in rates, um, and I think really the other one is really the Fed's got to come up with this, how do I actually unwind the QE? Yeah. And that is not a simple thing to do because QE is so complex, there's so many securities, you know, they've got to take liquidity operation, that is going to see yields back up anyway. So yeah. if, the mat, if, if you do the algebra, you know that. Yeah. Right? Seen it. A and we've seen the impact of this already, yeah. that it yeah. backed up from a housing rate went from three to four um, and rose 100 basis points and mortgage applications have fallen Just off a cliff. Plummeted. Um, and so that really comes to the point is, well, could it be fact that tapering starts in at the end of 2014 and takes them a year to complete? Yeah. Because mm. at uh, about three months ago they were talking about finishing it in June 14. I don't think they would have even started it by then. And, and when you think about it, you've got Yellen, you know, this is your first task. Mm. A is, is to uh, talk about the positive nature of the, the economy. But the reality, because the reality, mm. you're doing that, she's got to undo taper and that's really hard. Well she was the one that was uh, primarily responsible for it, she was yep. uh, the leader of it. Yep. <laughs> Look that's all we have time for today so thank you very much mm. uh, for coming on the show to our guests. We've got Jonathan Barrett from Barrett's mm. Bulletin, we've got Matt Sherwood from Perpetual. Really appreciate you taking the time to come out on Friday night. Mm. Thank you for all the emails, we will respond next week. Until next time I'm Mark Todd, Big Securities, have a great night. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should